We can't wish away federalism in Ethiopia, no matter how hard we try. By Dr. Tsegaye Ararsa, January 2019, Ethiopia's multinational federalism has not been without its detractors. For years, we had debated this endlessly, and for a while, the detractors seemed to have come to terms with it because they had run out of ammunition. In a more extensive piece, I will engage with the anti-federalist moves resurrected by Prime Minister Abe's reckless and polarizing rhetoric, who, by the way, did not hesitate to characterize it as racialized or racist to label Zeregna federalism. But for now, it is important to point out some of the distortions in Mamdani's piece, apparently misinformed by his Ethiopianist, not to say Amhara supremacist, students at Makarere University, and partly manipulated into it by those who knew of his well-known skepticism about ethnic-based distinctions between natives and non-natives elsewhere in Africa. Professor Mahmoud Mamdani added his voice to the band of those who bash what he calls ethnic federalism in Ethiopia. As a view from a distance, its inaccuracies may be forgiven, but the distortions and bogus claims can't. Mamdani deliberately uses the term ethnic federalism to refer to Ethiopia's federal arrangement, showing his prejudgment about the system before analyzing whether it is so. In this, he only followed the tack of the Habesha commentators who used this phrase and several others, for example, tribal or Yegosa federalism, racialized or Yazer federalism, apartheid, balkanization project, Stalinist federation, etc. More to justify the imperial and socialist paths in which non-Habesha peoples were conquered, subjugated, and exploited and subsequently given out to Nafsanyas literally as salaries because they are viewed as useful chattels to work the land they were dispossessed of through conquest than just to vilify the current dispensation. It is interesting to observe that, in contrast to Ethiopianist writers' frequent but reckless use of the phrase ethnic federalism, the phrase actually does not occur anywhere in the text of the Constitution or anywhere in the Ethiopian public law regime in general. The Amharic equivalent for nations, nationalities, and peoples is Biharok, Biharesebok, Enahizbok, a term roughly the same in meaning as its English version. In the Constitution, in Art 39, 5, there is no difference in significance if any group is referred to by any of those three words. There was, of course, a difference in size and rights during the Derg era. And many of the Derg era folks, especially Habesha supremacists, still make that distinction to deny some groups, especially in the South, the self-determination rights granted by the Constitution on account of being nationalities, or peoples, as opposed to nations. Foreigners often use it recklessly, either as a shorthand for the rather cumbersome nations, nationalities and people's phrase, or, at times, just to be lazy and uncritically follow the tack of the Habesha writers. Mamdani's New York Times article is one such piece. More careful scholars, for example, Will Kim Licka, George Anderson, James Tully, Jan Irk, Alan Tarr, Robert Williams, Ronald Watts, Farron Riquejo, who also uses plurinational federalism, Michael Burgess, Thomas Fleiner, Lydia Basta Fleiner, Brendan O'Leary, and a host of others use the term multinational federalism. I myself use the same phrase, although I also use plurinational federalism in more sophisticated professional venues. This multinational federalism is in perfect congruence with the historical fact that the federal dispensation was negotiated to solve what was characterized in the student movement of the 1960s as the national question. It took years and a lot of consistent insistence on our part for the generation, including those in the EPRDF leadership to catch up with this phrase. It had almost become a word of mainstream use until Abi came and started to make speeches that seek a reversal of the rights of nations, especially that of the Oromo. 
He is on record criticizing Oromo nationalism more than any of the other nationalisms in the country. Naturally, the Amhara supremacists jumped onto his bandwagon of disparaging Oromo nationalism. Contrary to what Mamdani says, the trouble with Ethiopia is not ethnic federalism, as Ethiopia's federalism is not ethnic in the first place. The trouble with Ethiopia is not federalism, as it is impossible to practice without democracy. The trouble with Ethiopia is not even ethnicity. The fundamental trouble with Ethiopia is the nature of its state that still operates on the basis of values that divide citizenship unevenly between the Habesha core and the heathen periphery, the civilized Semitic center and the uncivilized others, the imperial settlers of the garrison towns and the dispossessed and displaced indigenous groups. The problem with Ethiopia is the explicit in the past and tacit in the present ranked relationship that operates to differentiate between Ethiopians as citizens and subjects. The trouble with Ethiopia's federalism is that it wasn't yet federal enough as there was not the prerequisite democracy to make genuine federalism operational. Indeed, the trouble with Ethiopia is not more, but less, federalism. Unlike Mamdani's claim, the trouble with Ethiopia is not as much a flawed constitution as lack of democracy. The problem, in the eyes of many Ethiopians, is the failure of EPRDF to deliver on the promises of the Constitution. It is no accident that all the recent resistance against the regime in the course of the hash oral mop protests and beyond, from corner to corner, were invoking and calling for the delivery of constitutional promises. This was the case in the Muslims' quest for freedom of religion, the Oromo demand for self-rule, land and equitable share in resources, opportunities and power, the Cayman demand for recognition of identity, the Sadama and Agaw quest for autonomous statehood, the Konso quest for local self-rule, the Somali quest for equality and or self-determination in Ethiopia, etc. Yes, there is a polarity among ethnic groups in Ethiopia today, but that is more because of the PM's agitation to curtail and limit the rights of the nations by wanting to reconfigure their territory, by seeking to revise the constitution which was the rallying point for their struggles so far. It is also because of his stalling of the much-anticipated democratic transition by short-circuiting it to an Amhara supremacist Ethiopian nationalism. Mamdani is wrong in saying that land rights are granted on the basis of ethnicity. The land is a state property currently being sold around by the government to displace farmers and give it over to foreign and local investors. Mamdani was also wrong in characterizing the resistance to the master plan as an ethnic resistance to civic citizenship. It was a resistance against forced evictions and displacement, a resistance against a strategy designed to push out and, working under the imperative of a typical settler colonial logic, eliminate the Oromos along with their language, identity, and culture from their own country. Mamdani talks about inconsistencies in the ethnic federal system that created only nine states out of 90 ethnic groups. Precisely, if it was ethnic, how could this have happened? The problem is that you called it ethnic and then failed to find it on the ground. And by the way, the two city administrations are not city-states, not by a long shot. Finfini was a city-state between 1991 and 1994, but no more. Diradawa has never been a city-state. In fact, constitutionally speaking, it has always been, and it still is, an Oromo city, illegally wrested from Oromia by TPLF-EPRDF, who, ever since has made a mess of the administration, including through an illegal and unconstitutional charter that projects the city as an autonomous city. No, there are no ethnic mobilizations for homeland today. There are only mobilizations for self-rule in their homeland, 
either as a separate state in the Federation or as a unit of self-administering local government at the zonal, district, or special district levels. There are no disenfranchised groups anywhere in Ethiopia today. There are places, mostly urban sites, where settlers lived for decades as part of the settler colonial legacy, or newcomers as beneficiaries of freedom of movement recognized in the Constitution, are concentrated. They have all the rights, often the more privileged rights, in their places of residence. They have full rights of voting, election, and right to property there. They often complain that they couldn't run for office because of the legal requirement, which, incidentally, is now repealed since August 2019 that they should speak the local language. That's as it should be because they can't serve their constituency unless they can communicate the language of the people there. Instead of learning the language of the people in whose midst they live, these minority residents seek to create an enclave of Amhara colony where they are the viceroys for their Amhara political inclination and yet complain that they are discriminated against on the basis of language, that their freedom of movement is limited, etc. Nothing is farther from the truth. This is a peculiar phenomenon noticed in the garrison towns of Asala, Goba, Adola, Shakiso, Nagali Burana, Dilla, Yirgalim, Hawassa, Harar, Adama, numerous other towns of the empire, and now in large parts of Benishangul Gumuz, Gambela, and Afar. In his conclusion, Mamdani advocates for amending the constitution to abolish ethnic federalism, which he believes obstructs the desired reform. However, his argument lacks a rational causal link between federalism and the stalled transition. Additionally, he fails to present a viable alternative in how it would facilitate the sought-after reform. The assumption that Abe is a reformist hindered by the Constitution is flawed. In reality, Abe is not a true reformist, having emerged as an opportunist who sabotaged the struggle for freedom. Despite being backed by Mamdani's former student Jawar Mohammed, Abi aligned himself with reactionary right-wing politics, masking them as Ethiopian nationalism. Instead of working towards democratic transition, Abi remains entangled in outdated imperial politics, even pathologizing the people to set the stage for his messianic ambitions. Moreover, Attributing the so-called border conflicts to ethnic federalism is misguided. These conflicts are, in fact, proxy wars instigated by the TPLF against Abbey, undermining federal self-rule and the federalist approach to intergovernmental relations. Abbey inadvertently has played into the TPLF's hands by making anti-federalist gestures. Attempting to tamper with constitutionally sanctioned multinational federalism will lead to disaster and potentially an endless civil war. A more practical and simpler approach is to focus on enhancing the transition to democracy while fully implementing the Constitution and delivering on the promises of multinational federalism. Firstly, demilitarizing politics is crucial. Secondly, Establishing a consultative inter-party platform that engages all political parties in discussing the direction, roadmap, and methods for democratization is essential. This should culminate in a credible, peaceful, competitive, free, and fair election. Any tinkering with the Constitution or its Federalist principles should be reserved for later stages. Attempting to rush this process may lead to civil war, pushing the nation toward the abyss. Therefore, it is vital to prioritize democratic transition and implement the existing constitutional provisions before considering any modifications to the federalist structure. We thank Dr. Tsagai for his 2019 reflection on this matter. We are grateful for our esteemed audience's attention.